Hey everybody, welcome back to our professional development webinar series for parish and diocesan ministers. Thanks for joining us today for a presentation with Chris Wesley on rebuilding youth ministry in your parish. If you're coming with us for the first time, my name is Jerry Deason, the Digital Marketing Manager at Ave Maria Press, and I'll be the moderator in today's webinar. This webinar, once again, is brought to you exclusively by Ave Maria Press in partnership with the National Conference for Catechetical Leadership, the National Association for Lay Ministry, and the National Federation of Priest Councils. You are being muted today, but you are able to ask questions, and questions can be sent to Chris by typing them in the questions section of the GoToWebinar, which you can see on displayed on your screen here. I'd also like to note that this webinar is being recorded and the recording will be sent to you uh, later this week, so watch your email inboxes for a link to that recording. Uh, you will be able to see Chris and I's faces during the live presentation, but those of you who are watching the recording will only be able to see the slides, so just keep that in mind. So with that, I want to welcome once again Chris Wesley to our webinar series. Chris is the Director of Student Ministry and Team Leader for for Parish Family Ministry Programs at Church of the Nativity in Timonia, Maryland. He has a bachelor's degree in Communication Arts, Electronic Media um, from Xavier University in Cincinnati, Ohio. Chris writes the Marathon Youth Ministry blog, ChristopherWesley.org, and is the host of the weekly Rebuilt podcast. He and his wife, Catherine, have two sons. So, Chris, welcome back, and thanks again for being with us to talk about a new book um, written by you in the Rebuilt series. So, um, good to have you back. Thanks, Jerry. I really appreciate it. Um, yeah, it's good to be back, and uh, finally the pastor allowed me to write a book. So uh, here's the youth ministry version for you all. Um, so uh, yeah, just um, uh, I guess just before I get into the uh, meats and potatoes of uh, today's subject, just uh, want to thank again Avi and Maria Press and, and Jared for having me here to speak and uh, you know, just talk a little bit about my story. And I mean, before I start, and maybe you've heard Father White speak before, maybe you haven't, but one thing he says, which I'm definitely going to echo, is everything that I'm sharing is uh, stuff that we've learned here, and we don't claim to be world uh, experts uh, when it comes to church ministry or youth ministry. We just feel like we're experts uh, right now in 2015 in Timonium, Maryland, in our Catholic parish uh, when it comes to the subjects that we talk about. So, um, with that said, uh, if anything I suggest works for you, that's awesome. That's an added blessing. If not, you know, no hard feelings. We'd still be Facebook friends or Twitter followers or whatever you're doing these days. But, um, but so today what I want to do is I want to talk about five steps to get your youth ministry started or restarted or uh, rebuild uh, the youth ministry program that you have in your parish. And it doesn't matter if you're a youth minister or if you're the pastor or um, – you know, you're just someone where youth ministry was shoved into your job description. Uh, you know, what I talk about today hopefully can be applicable to your paradigm. So um, I guess the, what I, I want to start out with is just kind of a little story. So I'm, I love hiking. Uh, one of the things that I absolutely love about hiking and camping is just being in the outdoors and, you know, kind of this idea of separating from what's going on in the world. And so about... Um, you know, a little over 10 years ago, uh, I was a Jesuit volunteer, and at the end of that volunteer uh, year, uh, one thing we did together was go on a hike in the um, uh, Appalachian Mountains along the Appalachian Trail. And so, you know, a bunch of us, we started out at um, one spot in Pennsylvania, and our job was to hike south down to uh, Maryland into the Blue Mountains, and uh, that would be our destination where we would end this uh, epic 30-mile hike. And so we set out really excited, um, you know, just charging straight ahead, lots of energy. And we're walking, we, we hit the head of the trail. And, and when we hit the head of the trail, there was a little bit of debate which way we should go. You know, some of us thought we should go to the left, others thought to the right. You know, but one person uh, emerged, which I'll admit was not me, so I'm just putting that out there, to say we should go to the right. And so we trusted him, we listened to him. However, there were a couple of people who were not entirely sure. And so we're heading along this Appalachian Trail. We're feeling good. You know, we're laughing, having a good time. And, and all of a sudden we uh, run into a hiker who's traveling the other way. And we say, um, we ask him, oh, um, you know, where have you been traveling from? And he says, oh, I've been coming all the way from Maine. And we're like, that's impossible because we're heading south right now. Maine is in the north. And he's like, no, I've been traveling from Maine and uh, New England and, and, and now um, I'm in Pennsylvania. And it was at that point where we looked at a map and realized that we were heading in the wrong direction. And so uh, 
you know, we humbly uh, admitted to ourselves that we were going the wrong way. We turned around and started heading south. And so a 30-mile hike actually ended up being about a 40-mile hike because of the extra mileage that we had tacked on. So uh, the important lesson uh, to this story is obviously you need to know where you're going. You need to know where you're traveling and, um, and the destination you wish, uh, wish to achieve. And I think that's one of the most important steps, and that's actually the first step to rebuilding a youth ministry, is to know your vision and your mission. In other words, what are you trying to do? Where are you trying to go? What are you trying to accomplish? You know, the vision is kind of that destination point. If you're set out to backpack from, you know, San Francisco to New York City, and you would need some kind of idea of where New York City is. You, you would need to know it's east of San Francisco. It's a place with lots of tall buildings. You have to get to it via tunnel or bridge. You'd have to have some of these basic facts of what New York City looked like or where it was located. Um, so that's kind of like your vision is your location, your destination. But then there's your mission, and your mission kind of explains how it is you get there. Like, you know, what's the strategy and what's the path that you're going to take to get there. And so at Church of the Nativity, we have a vision statement and we have a mission statement, and both of those are reflected in our student ministry vision and mission statements. But our, our vision statement is this. It's to make church matter by growing disciples who are growing other disciples amongst disconnected Catholics here in northern Baltimore County while influencing churches to do the same elsewhere. So as a Catholic church, where do we want to be? We want to be a church where church is relevant, where people are coming not asking, like, why am I doing this or why am I here, or they're not coming out of guilt or obligation. They're coming because they know it's an important part of their lives. We want to create a church where they're growing in their discipleship and they're, uh, you know, not only growing in their own discipleship, but they're growing other disciples as well. They're, they're teaching other people how to grow in their faith, and that's important to remember as we get further um, talking about youth ministry. And we feel like God has called us to do that here in northern Baltimore County. 21093 is our zip code. That's our parish guidelines and everything. So God's calling us to do that here. And he's also, we feel like, called us to, to influence other churches. We want to be a church that, again, is sharing our story. And hence, that's part of the reason why Rebuilt and Tools and Rebuilding Youth Ministry have all been written is we just want to share our story just to let people know that they're not alone in the journey. So that's what we hope our church looks like. When you come, you see a church that's mattering, grow, disciples who are growing, other disciples, and growing themselves right here in Timonium, Maryland. Um, and so you might ask, well, how, how does that happen? How do we get there? And again, that's our mission statement. And our mission statement is to love God, love others, and make disciples. And the reason it's love God, love others, and make disciples is simply because you know, that's what Jesus Christ asked us to do, to do. He said, above all the other laws, all the other commandments, there's two. And it's to love God with all your heart, mind, and soul, and to love others. Um, and, and, and so that's what we're trying to do. And then he's also called us to make disciples as well. And so our job, we feel like, is not just to love God and love other people, but to help them grow in our faith. And that comes from the Great Commission when he said, go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. So that's the, a little bit of our vision and our mission statement. And what's, again, said in our adult congregation, which we call Big Church, is said in our student ministry as well as our children's ministry. And, uh, and you might ask, well, how do you develop a vision and a mission statement? Well, it first starts with prayer. Whether you are only five days into your job as a youth minister or you've been into youth ministry for decades, it's important anytime you're thinking about your vision, crafting a vision, or uh, articulating your vision is to spend time in prayer. And, and so just ask God, God, you know, this is your church. This is your mission field. This is where you've called me to be. What is it you want me to do? And, you know, if you get a clear right away, that's awesome. That's great. But do, sometimes developing a vision and a mission statement take time. It, it, it takes time and it, and it takes effort. And, it takes a little bit of collaboration. You know, it's not like Father White was just sitting in a room coming up with this vision and mission statement. Uh, in fact, you know, it was something we as a staff talked about, and we dissected, and we argued about it, and we, um, you know, went back and forth about it. But we wanted to make sure that we emerged um, with a vision that we could all jump on, that we believe that God had given to us. We also wanted the vision to be clear. You know, we also wanted to paint a clear picture. We wanted it to be memorable. That's why we use uh, words like make church matter, you know, the alliteration there, or growing disciples, we're growing disciples. 
We wanted to make it catchy, love God, love others, make disciples. And it wasn't to be cute. It was just because we wanted vision to stick. We wanted our volunteers, our ministers, uh, our, our people in our congregation to know the vision and the mission of our church and, and even our youth ministry. And in fact, it's also your vision and your mission is something that you need to share. Uh, for us, we share that not just to our volunteers and our leaders, but to people in the pews. We share this at our student program. So, you know, no matter who your audience is, it's important to share that vision and mission because then people get a clear or more clear understanding of who you are and where you're from. And then once you develop that vision and mission statement, it becomes a lot easier to build programs and events and systems and structures that will feed into your youth ministry. So this is probably the most important step to start with, although you know you don't have it have to have it 100% complete to get onto step two or three or four or five um, that I'll talk about. But it's important to get a good sense of what you're trying to do and where you're trying to go before you start investing a lot of time, money, and uh, resources into the next steps. So develop a vision and develop a mission. Next step, know your audience. Now that might sound like a, a like kind of a step we might take for granted because our audience is teenagers. But then again, what type of teenagers do you have in your community? I mean, Timonium, Maryland, just to give you a sense, is a suburban neighborhood uh, just outside of Baltimore City. Um, influences are the Baltimore Ravens, lacrosse, uh, going down to the shore. When people ask what school you went to, they're not talking about your university, they're talking about your high school. So Timonium is different from any other place in the world because it's unique to uh, the people who live in it and uh, the, the, the influences and impacts that surround it. So it's important for us to know our audience. As a church, our audience, and for those of you who have read Rebuilt, know that it's a, a man named Timonian Tim. And just real short, Tim's a great guy, married, three kids, and um, you know he grew up in the Catholic Church, but somewhere around confirmation or high school, he stopped going because his parents stopped making him go. And, and all of his Catholicism is based off of what he knows from Catholic school and the Da Vinci Code. So um, that's kind of the, our target audience for um, our larger church. But in the youth ministry, it's not exactly Timonium and Tim's kids. Our target audience, more specifically, are uh, teens who are at risk of becoming future Tims. And so who are these teenagers? Well, they're basically teens who are overprogrammed, overstressed. Uh, they're stretched each way, um, you know, every which way you can imagine. Uh, they just need a chance to breathe. They have high expectations, you know, from their parents, from their coaches, from their teachers, from society. They need to get into that Ivy League or that, uh, you know, elite private uh, college. Uh, lacrosse in the spring is their god. In the fall, it's all about Ravens football. Uh, you know, and, and so these are the teams we're trying to reach. They also have a big heart. You know, everything about our teen, Timonium teenager is not negative. There's actually a lot of positives. They have such a big heart. So when things happen around the world, things that they are, you know, thousands of miles away from happen, they want to jump on board and they want to be a part of that. So they get involved in social media, um, yeah, social media causes, you know, like the uh, ice bucket challenge that happened this past summer. You know, they're looking to make a difference. They want things to change. They hate injustice. You know, our teens are all about, you know, making a difference in the world. They just don't know how to. And so because we know these things about the Timonium teenager or our audience, we're able to create programs and systems that help them um, not only fulfill those dreams, but fulfill those dreams through a relationship with Jesus Christ and with God. So you need to develop a vision and a mission. Where do you want to go and how are you going to get there? And you need to know who you're talking to. Again, who you talk to, who you're talking to is so important because you're going to need to know what what examples and what analogies and what um, you know points are going to be relevant to their paradigm. So it's really important to know you, who your audience is. Now, how do you get to know your audience? Um, it's simple. It's just spending time in it. You know, maybe it's uh, going to a couple of you know soccer games or football games. Uh, it's inviting some of the parents or or, or um, teens out you know, for a bite to eat and just saying, hey, share, share with me what's going on in your life. Or best yet, connect with people who also work with youth in your community. So maybe it's people who are coaches, people who are teachers, principals, 
uh, people who are uh, community organizers, uh, people who work at the local YMCA. Uh, just try to connect with people who have like an ear to the ground on what's going on in the community so that they can help you understand how to reach that um, audience. So develop a vision and mission, know your audience, and then the third step, the third step is get teens invested. Now, I find that this is really an interesting step. It's almost one that we, I think, overlook um, because it can get kind of messy. But when you get teens invested into your parish, it does a lot. It creates a natural advocacy uh, for your parish. Your par people in your parish become more aware that teens are Um, mass the weekend uh, experience. Uh, he's cueing Father White on when it's time to go out. You know, he's helping us organize when uh, EMs need to, Eucharistic ministers need to get ready, and ushers need to get ready to pass out baskets and everything. And and he's only uh, a 16 year old kid, but he's taken this kind of leadership. We have another um, kid, Ryan, who um, works uh, with our uh, our creative director, Lucas, and he's basically running cameras and you know, calling shots on, um, you know, what we can do to better amplify, uh, you know, the, the message and everything. Um, and I, I'm totally realizing if you've never uh, read about Nativity, you're probably like, what, what is he talking about? Well, my point is that we have teenagers who are not only um, here on the weekend, but they're a part of our leadership team. And the way we invest in them is the same way we invest in adults. In adults. In fact, we invite them to sit at the table with us so that we can talk to them um, at, as leaders, not just of the future church, but of the present church now. So how do you get these teens invested, especially if you're the youth minister? Well, it starts with a conversation with your pastor. Your pastor needs to be on board with this. Uh, talk to your pastor about where you would like to see teens serve outside of altar serving or maybe just doing uh, or, or, or lecturing. Um, talk about places where teens can serve. And then if you have someone who's in charge of your adult volunteers um, for, for your church, uh, whether it's your adult faith formation coordinator or a director of adult ministry, talk with them and come up with a plan where you can plug teens into ministries, into volunteer opportunities, uh, where they're serving not just alongside any adults, but a, adults that might be able to invest in them in a personal way. Because what you're creating there now is intergenerational ministry. So when you get teens invested, uh, you, again, not only give them the opportunity to serve alongside adults and feel like the church of the present, but you impact other adults who are serving because the level of enthusiasm and excitement takes it to a new level. And on top of that, uh, you, definitely get to, um, you definitely get to bring new life to your parish. So again, develop the vision and mission, uh, know your audience, get teens invested, and then invest in ministers. And invest in ministers, or in other words, invest in volunteers. Now you might be the most dynamic, you know, energetic, you might be the smartest person in your parish, and that's great and that's awesome. But it doesn't matter who you are, we're not meant to do ministry alone. 
we're, we're definitely not meant to travel on this journey alone. And, and in all reality, you can't because after a while you're going to burn out. There are going to be times where you're going to fall and you're going to fail and you just need other people to pick you up. And that's where it's so important to have ministers or volunteers around you. They're going to help you plan, coordinate, uh, lead, uh, step in, and, and just take that ministry to a new level. So for us in um, student ministry, we not only have several volunteers, but we have different levels of volunteers. Uh, we have people who serve as small group leaders. We have people who serve as crowd ministers, which I'll, I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, we have people who uh, serve in our confirmation program. But then we also have people who are leaders of those small group leaders, crowd ministers, and um, confirmation mentors. And those leaders of leaders, their basic job is to help organize, coordinate, schedule, and plan. And so what that enables me to do is that enables me to you know, focus on the vision. That enables me to work with the, uh, the pastor and um, the rest of the church staff on, on bigger picture things. What that allows me to do as a youth minister is reach more students because I only have the capacity to mentor and reach and affect a few at a time. So when you build up and invest in ministers and leaders, it expands your capacity and it allows you to take more off your plate um, so that you can have the capacity to do more on a regular basis. So it's important to invest in ministers. But the question might be, okay, how do I get these ministers? Well, here's the big secret. All right? this, is the, this is the silver bullet. This is the one way that you can get ministers, and it's so simple. It's you invite them. You just ask people to get involved in ministry. Now, I know I said it was simple. I didn't say it was easy, but that's really the best way to get volunteers or adults to serve in your ministry is to invite them and ask them. How do you do that? Well, there really is no wrong way except if you're going to force them or bribe them or, you know, um, you know, blackmail them. That is definitely wrong. But all you got to do is ask. And I think the reason we sometimes hold back from asking is we're afraid of that that two-letter word, that word that can just make us feel like failures, that can just totally tear us apart, and that word is no. So what we have to do is we have to fight against that word no. You know, um, when I first started here at Nativity, um, I actually inherited um, a group of volunteers from Tom Corcoran, um, who was my predecessor. and, and and Tom set me up with a, a bunch of uh, volunteers who were, who were really good and really great, and, and they were awesome. Um, but after my first year of ministry, uh, a lot of them kind of were moving on, and, and partly because they, they had decided to stay on that one year just to sort of help me transition in and everything. And you know, some people moved on for a variety of different reasons. And so I had a couple of volunteers left, but you know, I would lost a lot of them. Um, and so I needed to figure out a way to do that, uh, to recruit more volunteers. And so um, I just remember on the registration form for our middle school youth ministry, just asking the question uh, to the parents, would you like to get involved in youth ministry? And, you know, there was a yes box and a no box. And I just remember getting those applications in and just being so disappointed because application after a registration form after registration form was just a no and a no and a no and a no. And then one day, one day, as if like, you know, um, I felt like Charlie in the Chocolate Factory when he peels away the, uh, the chocolate bar wrapper and there was the golden ticket, there was a yes. And I got so excited and it was like so amazing. And I remember I just jumped on email right away and emailed this parent and I was like, are you serious? You really want to get involved in youth ministry? And she said yes. And, uh, and it was like the best thing I'd gotten my first minister on my own. I just felt so happy. and. Uh, you know, little did I know that God was blessing me with one of uh, my top volunteers, Jeanette. Jeanette was uh, just a, a parent of a middle school student at the time who was looking to get involved. And uh, she stepped in and um, she has now, she's still with us uh, today, so she's been involved for over nine years. But, um, you know, it was just a simple ask on a form. And, you know, there's been other times, too, where we've made announcements at the end of Mass or we've put um, requests in the bulletin or we've sent out a blast email to everyone that we have an email address to, and we've just simply invited them. But probably one of the most effective ways that we've invited ministers into ministry is on the weekend. So every Sunday, um, 
you know, my role here during Mass, when I'm not going to Mass, my role is just to mingle and get to know people. And, and that has many be benefits. One, being the fact that I can interact with the students and their parents. But two, I get to know people who um, could potentially be incredible volunteers. I just might not have known about them because they don't have a teen in our program. So I'm meeting young adults. I'm meeting senior citizens. I'm meeting empty nesters. I'm meeting single parents, married couples. I'm meeting a whole bunch of people, and I get to know them, and they get to know me, and as we uh, get to know one another, then um, I get that opportunity to ask them, especially if I feel they're qualified, ask them, hey, have you ever thought about trying out student ministry? And that can be a pretty intimidating question because a lot of people might push back and say no because they either don't have the time, um, which is a legitimate um, excuse because time is so precious, or a lot of times I get the response, I don't feel qualified. And, you know, it's really um, that, that fear of not feeling qualified, that's one that I feel is easy to work through. So what we do is we just invite people to check out the ministry through something we call First Serve. We just say, hey, you know what, show up, give the ministry uh, a try. All you have to do is, is be a fly on the wall, observe. Afterwards, we're going to sit down. We're going to ask a, a bunch of questions. You're going to spend your time, you know, shadowing, you know, another uh, seasoned volunteer. But we just want you to sort of check it out, and then we'll talk about it. And then, if you want to give it another try, you can give it another serve. And then, if you still like it after that, then we'll talk about getting involved. So, what you want to essentially do to break down that excuse of "I don't feel qualified" is to get give them kind of stepping stones or like bottom rungs of a ladder, if you imagine a ladder, you know, give them those first few rungs so that they feel at ease uh, getting involved. So for us, again, that's checking out the ministry, shadowing someone that's involved, and then giving them the ability to ask questions like, why did you do this, or why does this happen, or how do you work around this, or how do you get this done? And so for us, it's really important to make them feel, uh, you know, like they're involved, uh, that, 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 that they can get a good idea of what they're possibly going to uh, commit to uh, before they do that. So number one strategy to get v volunteers is to ask them, but one of the most essential ways you can do that is on the weekend through personal conversations. Now, I wish that it was as simple as just asking people, but then again, you have to invest in your ministers as well. So um, you know, how do you invest in, in ministers? Well, the first thing is to look for those people who are key leaders. Uh, people who kind of take initiative on their own. I mentioned Jeanette before, and, and one of the reasons I pointed her out is because when she got involved, it wasn't like she showed up and just kind of sat there with her, you know, uh, arms crossed watching students. She actually kind of stepped up and started initiating things, um, you know, uh, without me having to ask her to do that. She was creating an irresistible environment. She was creating authentic relationships, and she was helping me uh, create an opportunity that was consistent week after week after week. And so, uh, you know, one of the things that we, uh, that I thought about with Jeanette as well as other volunteers is, okay, I need to invest in them in the same way that my pastor is investing in me or I'm investing in myself. So I took them to a conference. Um, I took them to uh, um, several different conferences, whether, you know, is that some of the um, mega churches like Willow Creek or Salback or even to some of the things that um, happen within our diocese. I, I wanted to get show them how I'm learning to grow as a student minister or a youth minister and um, show them how they can grow as a youth minister. I also got them cool um, um, just like books and um, podcasts, uh, you know, um, introduce them to the things that I was reading, introduce them to the things that I was listening uh, to, and not only just gave them to them but had conversations about that. And if your team is small enough, like if you're just starting out and you've only got like maybe three or four volunteers, that's awesome. I would encourage you just to spend time, grab a bite to eat with them, uh, get a cup of coffee, and just talk about life. You know, you don't have to just talk about ministry, but talk about life, because what you're doing is you're building trust. And when you can have trust in those relationships, it's so incredible. It's so amazing the type of fruit that it will, um, that it will produce, because then when you have to step out, maybe because you're sick, or you know you just need to spend time with the family, or you need a vacation. You can trust that the people who you've left behind uh, to run the ministry are are qualified and have your intentions at heart as well. So again, ask your volunteers uh, just through a simple invitation. 
uh, you know, invest in them through different resources. Uh, if you can, if you can afford it, bring them to a conference or uh, some kind of meeting or workshop or seminar. Um, and, and share with them the resources that you're using to grow. Uh, and, and, you know, something that I think is so important, and I've shared this with other staff members too, and I think it's so key, is treat your volunteers like they're staff. Like, treat your volunteers like they're your employees. You know, have those same level of expectations you would as if you were paying them to be there. Because when you raise the bar, they're going to want to reach that bar. When we kind of let them off the hook or say, hey, you know, it's okay, show up when you can or anything like that, you know, we set a low expectation. But when you say, hey, I need you here every single week, or I need you to prep for this material, or I need you to get this done and everything, um, they're going to rise, the right people will rise to that bar. Now, the last part about investing in ministers, which I think is one of the, probably the hardest parts, and I talk about this in Rebuilding Youth Ministry, is how to let them go or how to help them move on. So how to let them go, I mean, the important part is you don't just need people. You need the right people on the bus. You need the right people in the right places. So if you see someone who's not working out in your ministry, the first thing that I would suggest is, one, you know, have a conversation with them about it. You, know, you don't want to let someone go you know, out of the blue and just totally shock them and, and ruin their experience at church. But have that conversation uh, with them and, and see if it's something that they just, you know, maybe need a little pep talk. But after that, you know, um, look at putting them in a different place in your ministry. Sometimes we have the right people just in the wrong places, you know. And, and so in those cases, instead of asking that person to step down, just say, hey, you know, instead of uh, greeting people at the door, why don't we have you, um, you know, plan an activity? Or instead of small group leading, maybe what we can have you do is communicate with parents. Um, help me communicate with parents. So put the right people in the right places. And if you have the right person, but they're in the wrong place, move them. And, and put the, your strongest people and your strongest opportunities as well. Now, if you have that wrong person, it's important to address the situation you know, as soon as possible. You've already talked to them. Maybe you've tried putting them in a different location. But now it's time to talk to them. First thing is don't do it alone. Uh, partner up. Maybe it's another staff member. Maybe it's another volunteer. Especially if it's someone of the opposite sex, make sure um, you know you have someone there of the same sex uh, as the person you're talking to. But just talk to them and let them know that you love them, that you care about them. But maybe they would be best serving in a different area of the church or you know just a different area altogether. And it's going to hurt. It's going to sting. People might cry. There might be um, you know ill feelings at first. But if you do it this way, what you're doing is you're preventing a situation from really blowing up in your face. So, you know, that's how you let go of someone who doesn't fit in. But then it's also important to recognize that your ministers, as much as you love them and as much as you might want to keep them forever, people do have like a shelf life in the sense of how effective they'll be in ministry. Not that they will fall out of love of ministry, but maybe over time they just feel like they need to be someplace else. And so the important thing that you can do there is to have that conversation with them. Just say, hey, you know, like your commitment of a year or two years or three years, however long that commitment is, is coming up. What do you see yourself doing next? And when you have that conversation, if they say, like, I'd like to serve in a different part of the church or I just want to take a break from ministry, make sure you talk to them about replacing themselves. Saying, all right, you've had this role of serving pizza for three years and you've done a great job of making sure that the students each get an equal slice and, you know, that the um, and that, you know, we have always got enough pizza. Who do you feel is qualified to replace, uh, replace you? And, and work with them in regards to replacing um, them with someone who's going to fill that role. So, you know, invest in your ministers. Treat them like employees. You know, have that high bar and, and just be honest and upfront with them. And don't be afraid to lean into conflict when it arises. So that's our fourth step. Our four steps, again, are develop a vision and mission statement, know your audience, get teams uh, invested and involved, invest in, in ministers, and then lastly, start out small. Start out small. And this is huge. I mean, this is, like, incredible. When I first uh, came on the staff, as I mentioned, Tom Corcoran was my predecessor. He showed me his calendar uh, for youth ministry. And, you know, uh, I remember looking at it and just being in awe of how he had literally every Friday and or Saturday throughout an entire year planned with some kind of youth ministry event. And it wasn't like he was just some single guy with no life. I mean, he um, was at the time 
well, I mean, he was he was married to um, his wife Mia, but uh, before that, you know, he was dating her when showing me the old calendar and everything. And uh, I was like, how did Mia stay with you? How has Mia been with you? And he's like, honestly, I don't know, because his weekends, his his life had just been consumed by youth ministry, and it was it, it was affecting him in the sense where it was just burning him out, tiring him out, and that's because he started too big. And I think there's this pressure that we all face in youth ministry to be big. You know, it's all about the numbers. The numbers are important. They are. Attendance is important, and, you know, um, you know, it's all part of measuring the health of an organization or, in this case, a youth ministry. But don't try to start out big. So if you're doing a lot of events and you're trying to rebuild a youth ministry, don't be afraid to scale back on some of those events and start small. And when we say small here at Nativity, we don't just mean like in numbers necessarily, we also mean small groups. I feel that one of the easiest ways to start a youth program is with a small group program. And you might ask, well, why? Well, simply because there's really only three things we ask a small group to do. That's pray together at the beginning, share life together during the small group, and pray for one another at the end. It doesn't matter the curriculum or content that we're using. We just want leaders to know that when you meet with a small group, you're praying together, you're sharing life together, and you're praying for one another. Well, let's break that down, what that looks like. Well, praying together, I mean, that's pretty simple. Start the group out with a prayer, welcoming God into the conversation. What this does is it teaches your students that, you know, God needs to be a part of all your relationships. Sharing life together, that's basically what it sounds like, sharing life together, but in our paradigm, it's going through a, a list of questions or through the curriculum, but also allowing for students to interject with maybe a life situation where they need to, you know, bounce that off of their peers, like maybe they bring to the group, my parents are getting a divorce, or, you know, I just lost a relative, or, you know, I'm, I'm failing out of school, or I got cut from the football team. You know, it gives them a chance to sort of talk about it there and as a group to, you know, be accountable and encouraging to one another. But um, it also um, it, it encourages one another. It also lets them know they're not alone in life. And, and so we welcome that to happen during that share lifetime. However, we tell leaders, you know, always try to drop back into what the topic or the theme is that night. And then the last part is pray for one another. Um, we not only want kids to know that they should be allowing God into the conversation, but that they should be praying for their peers, for their brothers and sisters in Christ uh, as they go out and do the week. And so that's kind of, that's the basis of our small group program. And really all. All you need to do to start a small group program are about six kids, six kids and two adults. You know, ideally, you can do a boys group and a girls group um, uh, and uh, start out with two, two adult males and two adult females for, for those groups and everything like that. But, um, yeah, just start out small. Try to get six kids together, and maybe it's you and your spouse or you and your significant other or you and, you know, another volunteer in the church. Just starting out and trying to meet, you know, on a consistent basis, just praying together sharing life together, and praying for one another. Now, what curriculum should you use? You know, I, I can recommend a whole bunch of them, but really the most important part is getting the structure down, is getting that template down of meeting on a regular basis, praying together, sharing life together, and praying for one another. And as you get more comfortable with that structure, as you get more comfortable with that system, you can build on that. You might want to add a larger group. As you get more small groups, you might want to add a larger group program where everyone rallies together. Maybe you do large group games, large group talk, large group music, and then you break them up into their small groups. But start with that small group. Start small. Now, I've used the word consistent a couple times in this presentation, and what I mean by that is try to have groups meet consistently, and we feel like consistently is actually every single week. And now I'm not suggesting start out 52 weeks in a year. Again, I said small. So the way that we did it here at Nativity is we started our small groups as a six-week program during, uh, during the fall. And after those six weeks, we stopped and analyzed that for a little bit. And then we started uh, six weeks again during Lent. Um, and, and after that, we analyzed it again, and we, we talked about how good it was. And because we had done six weeks in the fall and six weeks during Lent, it gave us a lot of time to process, a lot of time to fix mistakes, a lot of, times, uh, a lot of time to uh, tweak things and to grow the program so that the following year we could grow more groups and on top of more groups we could um, we could go a little bit longer so that next year we went eight weeks in the fall and eight weeks um, in the spring 
and then we went 10 weeks and 10 weeks, and then the following year we just did small groups all year round. And that allowed us to really uh, grow a solid structure. But again, we started small. We started with just a few students and a couple of leaders, and uh, we made sure that that structure was correct. And, um, and so you start out small, and the more excellent, the more efficient, the more professional your program and the more like solid your foundation is, uh, the, the better, the easier time you're going to have as it grows and as a buzz generates, which it will when you do anything excellent, when you do anything well, uh, a buzz will generate. You'll be prepared for when kids do bring their friends and invite their friends to join. So again, those are the five steps of just getting started and rebuilding a youth ministry for your parish. Again, it's develop a vision and mission statement. Where do you want to go and how do you want to get there? It's knowing your audience. Who are you trying to reach? Who are you trying to connect with? Um, again, it's getting teens invested and involved in the everyday parish life. Um, it's, uh, again, about investing in your ministers or your volunteer leaders. And then it's starting out small. Now, I know that there's a lot of discussion out there about, like, you know, well, can youth ministry just be a program or can we just get teens involved in the parish? And I think both aspects are good, but we have to work to do both. And the reason is because teens need to feel like they're a part of the parish, but at the same time, we also want them to, uh, we, we also want them to have um, environments where they're connecting with their own peers, where they get comfortable sharing their faith with their peers so that when they go to school, when they're on the soccer field or the basketball court, they're very comfortable talking to their peers about their faith. And so that's the benefit of doing ministry, intergenerational ministry on the weekend, as well as doing a youth program during the week or on an off uh, mass time. So again, I thank you so much for joining me. Uh, let me say a little prayer and then um, we'll definitely open up for a little Q&A. You know, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Amen. Well, God, I just want to thank you uh, just for this time just to share um, what's going on uh, here at Nativity and, uh, you know, just uh, a chance just to uh, speak to uh, just so many youth ministers, so many people who care about the next generation, Lord. And I just, I just ask that you uh, watch over them and that you guide them and that you uh, continue to encourage them and remind them that they're not alone and that while youth ministry is... Uh, you know, messy, and it's sometimes complicated, Lord, that uh, it's really filled with so much reward and so much fruit. God, just thank you so much for uh, this opportunity to spend time together, Lord, and I just, uh, again, thank you for being with us. In your name we pray. Amen. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. All right, and hand it over to Jared. All right. Thank you, Chris. <clears throat> Excuse me. Let me pull up the... Uh... But just as a reminder where, where you can ask questions, it's in the questions section of the GoToWebinar panel. Um, you can see it there. We have a bunch of questions that came in already, um, and I'd love to hear some more that are coming in. Uh, we have tons of questions about the last part you, you were talking the, the, uh, about how to invest in ministers, how to really get people recruited as volunteers. And that's one thing, Chris, I'll just point out. I mean, that's one of the things that have most amazed me about Nativity is the number of people that you get in, involved in volunteering, not just with you know traditional youth group as a like, youth right. group, night, but all the different things that you guys are doing. It's really impressive. So maybe we'll get into some more details there with some of the people's questions. Um, yeah, and the other thing I, I thought that was really interesting that you said at, at the end, which it might be counterintuitive to a lot of new youth ministers coming in, is not to feel the pressure to go in and create this huge kind of life teen night or youth, youth night that's going to be the youth group but to right. focus on a small group. And that, that seems like such a feasible thing to do, find a small group of people and then start another small group and another small group and then build from there and then mm -hmm. go on to the larger group. Um, that's something that I think maybe not traditional, but, but I'm sure from your experience, it's probably more intimate and, and more effective. So thanks. Definitely. Thanks. Okay, so good. So we have a lot of questions coming in. Um, I'm going to ask a few, Chris, and throw them out at you, and you can hopefully um, address some of the things that they've asked. So, um, this is from, from Lori. Uh, how do you recommend asking for volunteers when you aren't exactly sure yet of what you're asking them to do um, for your youth group, for your youth program? Actually, sometimes that's like the best way or best time to ask them is just to be totally vulnerable, you know, and just say, um, you know, find, find people first that you can trust to be vulnerable with um, in the sense where you say, hey, listen, I just need help. I mean, when you say to someone, I just need help and, um, uh, and I'd like you to help me and, and be a part of this, 
uh, some people will jump on board and, you know, it's not just about finding doers, it's about finding thinkers and creatives. Um, so you might find someone who's creative coming up with ideas to help you create those strategies and those systems and, and structures that you need. So what I would say is if you're not sure what it is you need to do, like the vision and mission aren't exactly clear yet, invite people to be a part of that as well. Don't put that burden just on yourself. Good. We have a question from um, Brian, and a lot of a couple of other people have asked similar questions. He says, "I've heard you say before that you don't like to merge confirmation and youth ministry. So, how do you run those as two separate programs, and, and how do you how do they work in sync with each other, or are they separate?" And a couple of other people have asked about sacramental prep as well. So, what are your thoughts? Yeah, on that? That, that's like a, a whole uh, man. That, that's a whole other webinar, I guess. But uh, basically, um, in short. Uh, Youth, um, you know, we used to have our youth ministry tied in with our confirmation, and, and the result was we had a lot of kids who didn't want to be there, who, who hated being there because they were forced to be there to, you know, uh, finish a check mark sort of thing. And so that really conflicted with kids who wanted to be there. So when we separated the program, the confirmation program stayed kind of large, um, and that's um, and uh, our youth ministry really shrunk. And when I mean shrunk, it like shrunk down to like five kids. Um, from something that had like a lot of kids before, and um, and so and those five kids also were members of our student worship band too. So it was worship band practice, and then I talked to them for a, a couple of minutes, um, and then we had small group. So um, it was really small back then. But um, I, what's important is you know the first thing you want to fix in your church, and this might sound funny saying fix and confirmation, but first thing you want to approach in your church is your youth ministry program and just continue to do confirmation the way that confirmation has be, been done because what you're doing by building your small group program or building a, a youth ministry uh, effective youth ministry program is you're going to build a, a, a farm system and a foundation that's going to influence the confirmation program so for us we do confirmation in 10th grade so for me, it's important to pour a lot of um, energy into our middle school youth ministry because if I know we're growing disciples in our middle school youth ministry, by the time they're of age to go through confirmation prep, they're going to have a lot more of a solid foundation. They're going to be a lot more enthusiastic about confirmation, and then that's going to allow us to tweak and make changes in our confirmation program. So whether you're using confirmation curriculum like Decision Point or Chosen or you know, you're doing something that your church has been doing for a long time, keep doing that. But focus your attention on the other ministry, the, the small group ministry that you're doing, and that will slowly but surely impact the confirmation program that you're doing. Good. So, um, again, lots of questions, so I'm sorry, everybody. I know, I know tons of questions have come in, so thank you so much for, for asking. Um, Laura has asked a couple questions about training. What kind of training do you do for, for these ministers that are coming, the volunteers that are coming in? Yeah, we're, we're still figuring out a lot of that. I mean, when I first started, a lot of the training that we just did were things I mentioned, taking them to conferences and, you know, sitting down one-on-one -on -one and just sharing vision and, you know, skills and, and everything. But now that our ministry has grown, um, what we'll do is uh, three times a year have a large group gathering. So once before programs start for the fall and we make it our kickoff, and it's really celebratory, but our training there is just to remind them of what the vision is. And then halfway through the year, we give them kind of like a retreat feel, and we just give them strategies to like kind of knock down uh, assumptions or battle the uh, burnout that they might be experiencing. And then at the end of the year, it's kind of like a celebration, and again, it's a, a chance for us to um, just praise them and, and, and encourage them in what they've done. And we talk about the wins or the things that we've accomplished. And, and it doesn't sound like training necessarily, but those are, are – are, essential things you can do with your volunteers to help them um, grow in their ministry. And then um, the other things we do, like I mentioned, is we, we just have a room um, that uh, has shelves filled with books, and we tell our volunteers about that, and we're like, hey, check out these books. You're welcome to take them anytime. You know, If you accidentally take them home and lose them, no big deal. We want you to just have these books and, and read them. You know, uh, we've created a, a Facebook, a private Facebook page just for the volunteers to share You know, uh, blog posts or um, articles or, um, you know, uh, podcasts or things that they're coming across. So it's really organic in that way. So the, the only formalized training is really the, those big uh, three meetings. After that, it's really organic. And then um, every so often, um, Susan Smith, our middle school uh, coordinator, and myself try to just meet uh, with 
just small groups of ministers from time to time and check in with them on the go. So. Good, great. Thank you. Great answer. Um, I, I, I can't find the question of who was asking it, but the question was about, a couple of people have asked about it, but how this all looks in middle school. So you, you kind of described youth ministry, but I think people are aware that you're also doing this at the middle school level as well. So how does it look different in youth ministry? And again, you've talked about this, I think, in the other webinar you did about small yeah. groups, but I, kind of, I think it's good to reiterate it. You know, what is the difference between, the difference between youth ministry, uh, youth small groups for teens and small groups for, for middle school? Yeah, um, for for middle school, it's it, it looks a lot similar. It, it looks very similar to our high school ministry. Um, you know, the a couple of components that are different are um, you know our time frame is a little bit shorter. We meet for two hours with high school students. For middle school students, it's about like an hour forty five minutes. So not much different, but it is different. Um, you know, with high school, we'll talk about you know we'll go a little bit deeper into subjects with middle school students. We'll keep them at a certain level. But we also understand that middle school students have a lot of energy. So um, not that we don't do activities with high school students, but with middle school students, we'll give a, we'll, we have a component in our large group program that's just about them expediting that energy and allowing them to get a little crazy. So it, maybe it's a silly game, uh, like, um, you know, where they get a little messy or, you know, they just run around for a little bit. But we give them that time to do that. And we also give them permission to be middle school students where, um, you know, if they're a little squirmy, you know, uh, as long as it's not a huge disruption to the crowd, and I guess that's a, a, not exactly a, a specific description, but, you know, we try to um, we try to allow them to be middle school students. But for the most part, our structure is, is the same in middle school as it is in high school because, again, we want them to get used to this culture and this habit so that when they're hitting high school, they're already ready for a small group discussion. They're all ready to listen to a message. They're already... Um, um, willing to worship um, out loud to, to, to music. So um, a lot that you see in our middle school program is very similar to our high school program. Good. Uh, uh, so a question from Kimberly. Uh, I think a couple of different comments. She's, um, I think a common struggle. She says that basically, bluntly, how do I get more kids engaged to come to youth group? I've tried everything. I've tried fun events, uh, social events, spiritual events, service. And I just can't keep get the kids to show up. So what is, what is Kimberly, and I'm sure that many people like this, what do they do? Yeah, um, I mean, I, I understand that frustration because it's the same thing. I mean, um, you know, you want kids to show up every single week, and um, it's really hard uh, when you see someone not showing up or, or missing a couple. I think the first is, you know, just to understand that youth ministry is messy and that the feelings of frustration that you have are okay. Um, because you really do care about these students and you want them there, but it's to acknowledge that you are frustrated. Um, but the first tangible thing that you can do, uh, which you know, kind of was like an aha moment for me only a few years ago, is to tell students that they can invite their friends. Because I was talking to a few students once, and I was like, hey, you know, like, you know you can bring your friends and everything. And I felt in my mind that I had said that like a gazillion times. But this team was like, really? I can invite my friend to youth ministry? I can invite my friend here on a Thursday night? Like, I didn't know that. And I was like, I was almost like, really? Like, that's all it took? I had to tell you that you can invite your friends? And so the first thing we can do is tell students, hey, invite your friends. You know, and if they don't know what it is, just say, like, hey, just come out. There's a really goofy adult that tries to talk to us. You know, like, you can, you can make fun of yourself. But just encourage them to invite them. Um, you know, and then when they do invite a friend, praise them for that. Like, you know, just write them a thank you note uh, or you know, just tell them, hey, I really appreciate how you brought your, your friend or your cousin or your neighbor to youth ministry. That was awesome. Um, and then the probably the best way, uh, um, or not the best way, but a really effective way is to get it announced at Mass. Um, and not for you to do it, but to have your pastor do it too. Because believe it or not, the biggest advocate for youth ministry in your parish is not the youth minister, it's your pastor. Because uh, most people, even though you might disagree with this, are willing to listen to your pastor. So when your pastor says, hey, we've got an awesome youth program, and so-and-so is leading it, and it meets on Wednesday nights at 6 p.m., um, that's going to that's gonna speak volumes. And um, so try to get your pastor behind that and just ask him, hey, maybe in the homily, maybe at the end of the um, mass announcements, if you could just plug the student ministry, that would be great. It's not about throwing big events. It's not about you know getting in uh, high-level speakers or concerts or anything like that. It's just about creating a buzz and letting people know that they have permission to invite people to join the ministry. Good. So, kind of a quick follow-up question, I think, from Madeline. Um, she says she says 
you know, how do you get them to show up? Do you always have food, pizza, pop and chips? Uh, yeah, we what? do have food. Um, <laughs> we serve pizza and Chick Fil A, and um, you know, like uh, iced teas and uh, and everything. But we also we don't give those away for free. We 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 sell those. We sell like pizza at cost and the Chick Fil A sandwiches at cost. You know, we're not trying to you know start a cafe or a restaurant business, but we're like food is good and free food is good, but you know, like it also um, gets really frustrating um, when you're just cooking all this food for free and then you're wasting it. When you do it at cost, um, there's a little bit. Uh, I, would, I I can't really explain it, but ever since we started selling food versus just giving food away for free, well, we actually get rid of more food. Um, I, I don't know what it is, but. Uh, yeah, food is definitely a part of that. Uh, we also, when kids come in, and this is an important thing that I didn't mention before, um, our program on Thursday night starts at 7 uh, for high school, and that first half an hour is really just hangout time. It's time for kids to show up and hang out, and that's when we serve the food. We have a ping pong table um, out. We do cornhole. We have Connect Four, Uno cards, you know, just a chance for kids to hang out. And then we ask our adult volunteers, whether they're small group leaders or people who help with a large group program, just to wander around and intermingle with the students. Uh, so you mentioned earlier that you, you have, sounds like you have somebody who's kind of in charge of, of selling pizza or, or selling the food, yeah. is that right? Yeah. yeah, so those leaders of leaders, um, in our large group program, you know, we, have, we call them crowd ministers, and so we have people doing everything from greeting at the door, checking students in, selling pizza, um, but then we have, I have three leaders at our high school program, Joanne, Tina, and Netta, and they all coordinate those volunteers. And so Joanne, who's in charge of ops, she's also in charge of our cafe. So she always makes sure that there's an adult there who's serving the pizza, doing the exchange and everything. And, you know, she reports to me like, hey, we need to order less pizza or more pizza, um, you know, or can we change the, the, the prices or the system? And so she's thinking about those things and worrying about those things so I don't have to. But um, yeah. Chris, can you, can you take me, like walk me through or walk us through like um, a teen arrives at Nativity they walk in the doors. Like, what happens? What do they see? What's going on? And, and how does the, that experience go for them? These lar they're large group program, I mean. Yeah, we suck them into a huge void. No, uh, basically, <laughs> uh, when a teen comes up, their parent usually drops them off um, on a Thursday night when we have our high school program. They enter the door, and right there, there are two adults wearing blue T-shirts uh, with our logo on it saying, hey, we're so glad to see you, um, wow. and they check them in. Um, if they know their name or not, it doesn't matter. They check them in. They just say, we're so glad to see you. And then after that, they say, "Why don't you hang out in our cafe? We've got pizza and Chick Fil A, um, and you know, and everything." And so they go in there. And if it's a new kid, a kid we've never recognized, they tell one of the other crowd ministers, "Hey, go find out who they are, why they're here, and everything like that." And, and so they start co conversation like, "Oh, what grade are you in? Where do you go to school? Like, do you have a job? Things like that." And by finding that information, they're able to connect them with other teens. And so that teen then we're hoping during that hangout time is connecting with other teens. And then about seven thirty we send them back to another room called the theater where we have our large group program. And at 7.30 we start with prayer and then we have the student band come out and they lead worship and during that time we do an offertory um, and then we do an activity. Um, <clears throat> sometimes it's reflective, sometimes it's a little fun. And then myself or someone that we designate comes up and does a, a talk or a message based on a certain theme uh, or a certain topic and uh, it's also based on what they're they'll hear it in the liturgy of the word on the weekend. And then after that, we break them up into their small groups. And in those small groups, again, they pray together, share life together, pray for one another. And then about 9 o'clock, they wrap up and they go home. Good. Wow, that's awesome. That's really, um, I can imagine that that's just, that seems to me so organized. And uh, I'm guessing it wasn't always that way, Chris. Maybe maybe I'm wrong, but I, how I, did I you get to the point where you're right now? I my name at the same time. <laughs> so that's, that's great. <laughs> I mean, how did, how did you get to that point, though? How did you get to the point where you had all these people that are doing these different roles and, and, and filling and making this kind of system go through? It was, it was identifying, like, things that I was doing that I should have should not have been doing because they were interfering with the things I had to do. Um, so, like, you know, before we had a lot of ministers, I was serving pizza, and yeah. if there were things to set up for the activity or the game or, you know, just, you know, uh, or even starting things on time wouldn't happen because I was so occupied with um, serving pizza or, you know, like um, if I was going around greeting students by myself, then if Chris Wesley didn't connect with that student, it became like a big deal. Like Chris, if, 
I'm not one of Chris's favorites. So I had to make it less about me and more about just adults and teenagers. So for me, like um, during the hangout time, I'm present, but I'm kind of stepping back so that these other volunteers can interact. So it's about identifying the things that you're doing that's preventing you from doing the things that you should be doing. All right, so I love that. I mean, I'm sure a lot of people are thinking, you know, if, let's say I actually do get a yes and I got somebody to volunteer, and what do I have them do? That's a great exercise right there. You know, what are you doing that you shouldn't be doing? And right, that's exactly. You know, having exactly. to fill those rules, good. Well, well, Chris, I wish we had more time. And, gosh, you should see the number of questions I have here in front of me. Um, there's tons of questions, and, and uh, I'll, I'll send them to you, and hopefully you can ask them maybe on the Rebuilt Podcast later on yeah, um, or at some point. Um, but, uh, yeah, excited to have you here back again, and there's so much to do and so much to say. I know you've talked about the book a little bit, and um, my PowerPoint's slow a little bit, but, but the book, yeah, hold it up there. There we go. Yeah, um, it's now available on Amazon, so uh, that's great. So Or Ave Maria Press, they can order that there too. Um, but, yeah, uh, yeah, 20% off. That's an awesome deal. So Yeah, there you go. So, yeah, you're welcome to – it's it's available on, on Amazon, anywhere books are sold, as, as well as as an ebook. Um, if you buy it at Ave Mira Press by being here at the webinar today, if you use the webinar code, or promo code, webinar303 for today's date, you can get 20% off, which is cheaper than Amazon today. So um, if you want to take advantage of that, go ahead and do that. Um, we'll send you the link with the, the uh, discount tomorrow, too, or, or – or, with the, the recording, um, just be aware of that is also available. Mm -hmm. uh, real quickly, I want to mention our partners. I thank our partners as well: the National Conference for Catechetical Leadership, the National Association for Lay Ministry, the National Federation of Priest Councils. Um, they've been our partners from, from the very beginning of this webinar series, and we're, we're excited to have them continuing on through this year. Um, like I said earlier, you're welcome to connect with Abbey Maria Press, but also. Watch the webinar recording for this recording at, at AveMariaPress.com slash webinar hyphen videos, and you'll have this and all the webinars, including the webinars that two of the other webinars that Chris had. Just two, or is it more, Chris? Uh, this would be my third one, so two third, so, the, yeah. so there's two other webinars that Chris has been a part of um, related to youth ministry, student ministry, um, small groups. Um, feel free to check those out as well. Um, we'll send a link to this record recording later on tomorrow, and uh, we'll send you also a link with uh, invites to the, the future webinars that will take place here in the spring. But before we go, Chris, I just want to say thanks again one more time for, for you, um, your gifts, and your, and your ministry. So I appreciate your time here today. Hey, no problem. Thank you very much, Jerry. Okay. Take care, everybody, and uh, God bless.